Hello, good morning or afternoon, everybody, depending on where you are. Um, and thanks for joining the Midwest Energy Solutions preview panel on the effects of COVID-19 on energy efficiency. Admittedly a big topic, but we've got a great lineup of presenters with us today who will be able to start a substantive discussion while hopefully leaving you all wanting more so you'll have no choice but to join us for the whole shebang come February. Again, my name is Sarah Moskowitz. I'm the Deputy Director at the Citizens Utility Board of Illinois, and I'm joined by my esteemed panelists, including Pat Stanton, Director of Policy at E for the Future, Commissioner Tremaine Phillips of the Michigan Public Service Commission, and Mark Schoenheider, Manager of Customer Energy Solutions at Excel Energy. Here at Cub Illinois, we spend a lot of our time convincing consumers, stakeholders, and policymakers that energy efficiency is really the unsung hero of ensuring an energy system that is sustainable, both economically and environmentally. And energy efficiency's role in creating jobs is a big piece of that narrative. So I'm going to turn it over to Pat Stanton from E for the Future to start. She's going to kick us off by speaking about how the pandemic has impacted the energy efficiency workforce. So Pat, take it away. Great, thank you so much. And um, if we can get my slides up, that would be awesome. So before I get started, I just wanted to get a, a shout, give a shout out to uh, E4's partners uh, in developing all of the analytical work um, that is behind the numbers that I'm gonna be able to present today. Uh, first of all, I'm sure uh, I've spoken uh, to you folks before about the annual Energy Efficiency in America report, which we've been publishing with our partners, BW Research and uh, E2 Environmental Entrepreneurs since uh, 2016. And we just recently published the 2020 version, but we were happy to be joined in April by the American Council for uh, Renewable Energy, ACOR, and the four of the organizations have worked every month to uh, produce a and publish uh, the results of an analysis of the impact of COVID-19 on the workforce for clean energy. And uh, in that analysis, uh, we break out and analyze energy efficiency workforce impacts um, separately from the other clean energy. And we've been able to report on that every month. And um, so that will be that research, uh, which uh, just so you know, um, it's research that uses uh, the methodology from the, the US Energy um, Employment Report uh, and applies that to the monthly jobs reports, which come out on the uh, first uh, Friday of every month in the morning, uh, and also uh, incorporates information from the weekly uh, report on new unemployment claims. So the, the data that's used is from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. The methodology is uh, driven uh, by uh, the US Energy Employment Report. So with that, let's get started. So uh, the first slide. Great. So speaking, talking about energy uh, or talking about the um, job losses, we feel it's really important to start with the historic job gains and to put the losses in context. So we've been consistently, energy efficiency has been consistently the largest energy, traditional energy sector. Uh, as th those of you familiar with the US Energy uh, Employment Report or USER, there are four traditional energy sectors, fuel, energy, electric generation, transmission distribution, and energy efficiency. So not only the largest, but the fastest growing. So we have this great historical story to tell, and then we hit March 
of 2020. And the drop was so precipitous that it actually wiped out all of the gains um, from uh, the last four years. Um, so uh, now let's look a little bit um, into the impact on the industry. The next slide, please. So every industry has, or lots of industries have been impacted and we certainly uh, have empathy for uh, retail workers and restaurant employees and all uh, sectors uh, who have been adversely impacted. But to be specific, on November 1st, uh, as of November 1st, there were over 300,000 energy efficiency workers who had been working in February who were still out of work. Now, it's better than it was in April, but it's still pretty terrible. And uh, what we've learned is during the comeback, clean energy hasn't kept up with some of the other sectors over the summer and fall. So we're still, uh, our industry is still really struggling. Next slide. So as I mentioned, we do uh, this research every month. And so these are the, uh, the data that we had uh, just literally published this week. Uh, for the current uh, job loss figures, um, again, uh, relative to, uh, no to November, I mean, to uh, February, um, across the MIA states. And for those of us who are uh, attuned to workforce and have been following the weekly announcements of the new claims for unemployment insurance. This morning was really quite a shock. 19% drop in a week, the sharpest drop since March. Now this is um, not surprising. Certainly those of us that have been watch watching the growth in COVID cases have been really quite concerned that we would begin again to see uh, Actually, I misspoke. It's a, it's a drop in employment, but increase in employment claims by 19%. So uh, we've been quite worried about this coming, and it was kind of uh, very uh, sobering to see it actually uh, materialize in this stark uh, uh, value this morning. Uh, so the numbers above do not include uh, that. Uh, we're not in real time, um, but uh, I think it's quite concerning. So we also, I also, next slide, um, wanted to share uh, that we do, as part of the uh, EE Jobs in America report, we're providing this plot of the history of the job losses caused by COVID of uh, for each state. And we will be updating that um, as we uh, get new figures in. This came off of an old document, so it doesn't have November yet, but, uh, and um, at the end, I'll give you the uh, link to the new dedicated website that you can use to uh, get this information on any state um, that you're interested in in uh, following. So th there's no way to sugarcoat the adverse impact, uh, both on small businesses and individual employees and their families. Um, however, as an industry, we do have uh, an important positive message, uh, particularly uh, our advocates in, in uh, DC uh, are certainly um, advocating for energy efficiency to be included in stimulus or and or relief uh, funding. Uh, and we do have a good story to tell. So uh, I'll, the next slide shows a uh, 
outcome or, or summarize the outcome of an analysis. So E4 commissioned uh, EW research in April to look at how a major uh, funding of uh, stimulus could impact uh, both jobs and um, the economy. Uh, and energy efficiency, we all know, has this wonderful uh, magical opportunity of having there be loans that can be paid off from the savings. And that that allows for front-loading projects and um, getting people back to work. So we put together a single scenario. We can do other scenarios and we're, we're working with uh, a strategy group in DC to do that. Uh, but we put together a $60 billion federal stimulus example, which represents our funding type levels of investment. And we spent a, a good bit of time really researching how much private money would be leveraged by the federal money. And then to come up with the number of jobs, 700,000 jobs every year for five years. So, um, and billions of dollars in savings over and above any savings that are used to pay back the loans. So we certainly got uh, some good reactions. Um, our BW team has briefed both the uh, uh, speaker's office, speaker's Pelosi's office, and uh, minority leader Schumer's office on um, this uh, stimulus. And so we want to continually tell that positive story. Next slide, please. So another really positive story for energy efficiency is the cost uh, as a, or the potential as a way to reduce our carbon emissions and meet our carbon and uh, climate goals. And we think that there are certainly uh, lots of opportunities. Uh, many of us are aware the ACEEE did a research in 2019 uh, saying that we could, energy efficiency could quite easily produce 50% of the reductions in emissions needed to get us to 2050 goals. So energy efficiency is, is a really important part of that solution and that's a good, another one of the angles of good story to tell. And then the next good story is an opportunity, next slide, is opportunity to move forward um, on important issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion. It's much easier to look at bringing more people into a workforce that's growing. And historically, 2020, uh, not to be considered in that, but historically energy efficiency has been growing. It's demonstrated that it's been growing. It's consistently been growing. And we also know new information that we have in this year's report on age demographics show that in a number of states, the energy efficiency workforce is pretty top heavy in uh, seniority. Um, and a lot of folks are over 55, so that if you're looking at a 10 year horizon for workforce development, we're looking at quite a bit of churn and an opportunity to bring new faces and new perspectives into our industry. So as folks are looking for opportunities, particularly on the federal level to invest in workforce development, we think that energy efficiency has a really great story to tell about there being demand for the work and opportunities for new entrants into our workforce. And 
Uh, next slide. The next uh, slide shows just a couple of the new kinds of data that are available in this year's report um, on demographics. Um, get a sense of, of uh, how different um, uh, groups of, of workers are represented compared to the national average. I think also we have only at the national level, but some very, very interesting data um, on the quality of jobs in energy efficiency. And that'll be the next slide. So I just wanted to give a sh another shout out to E2. They pu recently published Clean Energy, the Clean Jobs, Better Jobs report. And this, uh, does a deep dive into the wages, whether or not people get benefits, and whether or not people get uh, retirement um, support. And they look at about a little over 18, I think it's a dozen and a half different um, Bureau of Labor to list Bureau of Labor Statistics um, SOCs uh, codes. So, for example, plumbers or electricians, and consistently, those who work who work for companies that do energy efficiency work, whose job titles fall under electricians or plumbers consistently make more money, especially in the uh, entry-level and mid-level job positions, and consistently have better uh, benefits and retirement than the average plumber or electrician. Uh, so it's, um, I think it's a really good story for us to tell, and um, we can, you know, certainly electricians in clean energy can be doing uh, solar work, but they also can certainly be doing energy efficiency work, having paid my electrician to install the electrical uh, service to my heat pump. I know that's the case. Uh, and next slide. So finally, I just want to let everyone know that this uh, year, we did set up a new uh, dedicated website for EE jobs uh, in America, and it is uh, interactive, allows you to check out different states, um, and we are, will be looking to, and also you can click on different states and get uh, different information uh, about that state. This view shows that graph uh, for Iowa of uh, job losses. And uh, so this is where you can get that information. Also keep an eye out. Uh, we did publish the November job loss information uh, earlier this week. And we uh, look at this point anticipate continuing uh, to monitor uh, the health of our industry going forward. And with that, I'll be happy to take questions. Next page. Are there any questions? Hi, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everyone. I am uh, going to share my screen here. And thank you very much, uh, Pat, for your presentation. I, uh, prior to taking on this job as commissioner, I was a fellow with the uh, E2 uh, program. And um, this is my community here. Um, before again, uh, coming on the commission in Ohio, I worked for a energy efficiency data analytics company there in uh, Columbus, Ohio, and then also was the first director and one of the founders of the Cincinnati 2030 district, which 
helps to achieve ambitious and bold energy efficiency, among other reductions in commercial buildings there in the greater Cincinnati area. So uh, I'm going to talk to you a, a bit today about our response to the COVID-19 pandemic here in Michigan. Uh, and uh, to the extent that I can um, talk about our response in relation to our EWR, our energy waste reduction programs, uh, you know, one thing that I will say initially here is that uh, we're still trying to understand what the implications of the pandemic uh, will be on our uh, utilities energy waste reduction uh, goals. Uh, you know, I think a lot of uh, those implications will be better seen as we come into uh, year. Just talking a, a little bit about uh, what has occurred here and, and taking a moment just to recognize, and uh, I hope you all there that are participating are staying well. Uh, I know that as this pandemic continues to grind along, the impacts and implications are, are striking closer to home. Uh, we just had a former staff member several days ago contact us and let us know that uh, they actually had to admit his brother to the ICU. Uh, I had to participate, unfortunately, in my first uh, uh, Zoom uh, funeral proceeding last week because uh, my cousin passed away from COVID-19 um, the day before Thanksgiving. It's just, uh, again, I hope you all are staying well and recognizing not only when you, within yourself, but within your respective institutions uh, and companies, uh, how much this may impact your workforce and and just taking the, the time that you need to over the break to uh, rest, relax, and, and restore yourself before the new year. So the, the pandemic here in Michigan, we were one of the uh, worst hit states there during the initial wave. Um, we first had our first presumptive cases on March 10th and quickly responded as a commission uh, soon thereafter, we actually were the first agency to go fully remote uh, and were able to do that uh, in about two weeks time. And we have been uh, operating remotely ever since March 15th. Um, and, and luckily just to uh, the um, ability of our staff and, and the great leadership of our chair, uh, Chairman Dan Scripps, and our other commissioner, Commissioner Sally Talberg, we have actually been able to operate uh, at equal, if not better, efficiency and effectiveness uh, while we have been uh, working from home. Uh, one of the implications of the virus that, that we saw uh, in terms of its impact of, in cases and fatalities, uh, we saw a great deal of disparities in the, in particularly the Black and African American communities. During the initial onset of the pandemic, 40% uh, of the fatalities here in Michigan were within the Black community. Again, primarily in Southeast Michigan, uh, Wayne County, and in the Detroit metro area. Uh, very much, I applaud our governor and our lieutenant governor. They created soon after that initial wave, uh, the coronavirus um, COVID-19 racial disparities task force in order to not only investigate why these disparities in outcomes in cases were taking place, but then also begin to direct uh, resources in order to address those, uh, uh, those uh, existing disparities. And, and even though the, the virus is once again um, raging here in, in the state of Michigan, uh, that percentage within, uh, of cases within the black community has now kind of gone back towards the norm um, uh, at least what we've seen in the last several months, and that's in part due to uh, the work of that task force and, and the commission's involvement uh, in that task force as well. Uh, once the pandemic really began to gain momentum, there was uh, a, you know, a number of, of issues that uh, the commission began to tackle and, and uh, address to understand how best we could respond for the sake of, of customers and communities uh, throughout the state. Uh, and, and some of the biggest areas of concern and contention were certainly uh, the unemployment rate we saw in the second quarter in Michigan and unemployment rate rise to 20%. Um, 
in addition to that, we saw really dramatic uh, impacts on low demand and consumption here in the state. So in terms of our industrial load, we saw decreases of 32%. Uh, that was largely due to a lot of the auto manufacturers and suppliers suspending activities during, uh, during the spring. Uh, consequentially, we also saw the increase in residential loads of uh, 20 or 21 percent there in the spring, reflecting, again, everyone uh, going home, uh, having a hotter than normal uh, spring and summer, and uh, the impacts and implications there. And so, that really uh, was of concern to us, knowing that a lot of folks would be at home uh, turning on the air conditioner and having uh, resulting impacts on their utility bills. On April 15th of this year, we issued the first of several COVID-19 uh, related orders um, uh, requiring uh, a number of um, follow-up uh, initiatives and, and items from uh, our state's utilities, as well as setting plans for how we would engage with utilities and uh, respond with our staff in order to best address the pandemic. This included uh, requiring increased uh, data from our utilities, data on customer arrears and uh, customer disconnections, and reconnections processes, looking for the utilities to expand uh, customer affordability and payment plans uh, during this time period, uh, modifying our regulatory processes and, and modifying some of our case procedures so that uh, not knowing what the impacts would be on our staff, trying to better um, evaluate that, that caseload that would be before the commission. Uh, we also suspended disconnections for uh, vulnerable customer classes, so for low-income customers and for senior customers. Uh, and then we also required the filing from our regulated uh, utilities here, we required the fire, filing of EWR and demand response continuity plans. So again, trying to ask of the utilities, how do you expect the pandemic to impact uh, the goals that you all have set forth in meeting in regards to your energy uh, efficiency targets? And then what do you all expect in terms of uh, being able to respond to those challenges and, and being able to try and still um, meet those goals and objectives? The other thing that I will note is that we were a state that did not issue a broad moratorium on shutoffs uh, for customers. We did issue a moratorium for the regulated utilities on shutoffs for low income and senior populations, but it was not a broad moratorium on shutoffs uh, across the board. The reason for that was, was several. One, um, we certainly wanted to provide or did not want to give the signal to those who did have the ability to continue to pay their utility bills uh, that uh, they should not. Uh, we wanted folks to move forward and try and, whether it was a dollar or full payment, try and put forth anything they could uh, on those utility bills uh, in order to not have this wave of disconnections and, and wave of arrears post-crisis. Um, additionally, we knew that our regulatory authority only extended to those investor-owned utilities here in the state and given that uh, limited authority and not wanting to create a patchwork of moratoriums across the state, uh, we decided that this was kind of the best uh, path for us to move forward. That did, however, require us to be very diligent and be very proactive in um, communicating energy assistance to customers. Uh, to working with the utilities to uh, push out communications regarding that energy assistance, to have them better coordinate their energy assistance programs and communications with their EWR and energy efficiency programs. That disconnect uh, was very uh, apparent at the beginning of the crisis, but we improved on that uh, quite a bit um, as we uh, went on uh, over the last several months. Uh, and, and just to identify some of the results that we had. Um, during the early stage of the pandemic, we were able to immediately reconnect 
uh, over 3,500 customers who were previously disconnected, either electricity or natural gas service prior to the pandemic, using uh, LIHEAP funds from the CARES Act, we were able to uh, directly provide energy assistance, so directly pay down um, utility arrears uh, for customers, uh, for almost 41,000 customers here in the state of, of Michigan. Um, and then we also were able to pilot some new energy arrears and, um, and uh, unpaid balance programs here in the state through an assortment of, again, federal and state uh, energy assistance dollars. So again, it, it really was uh, an effort, an unprecedented uh, collaboration between uh, consumer advocate organizations, uh, our utilities and our commission staff in order to really be diligent to get these resources out to community members. And, and you know, we're not uh, claiming victory cer certainly at this time, but what we've seen is that since the beginning of the pandemic, uh, the total uh, uh, amount of arrears for customers in the state of Michigan has decreased. Uh, in addition to that, we've also seen uh, initially a decrease and now more of a flattening off in those, uh, the number of customers who are in arrears here in the state. So I, I think we, we, uh, we took what was a, a pretty hard path in terms of not issuing that broad uh, moratorium here in the state but the results that we've seen thus far in terms of the, the total number of arrears, uh, our aggregate arrears in the state, and then those who are in arrears in the state uh, have been um, fairly uh, positive thus far, but we still have to be very diligent um, as the, the pandemic continues throughout the, the holiday period. Um, just a couple other items to uh, speak to really quickly. Uh, one of the really incredible collaboratives that has been led by staff here at the commission, uh, we have a collaborative that is uh, that couples our energy waste reduction programs from the utilities uh, with the needs and challenges faced by low income communities. Uh, this is a, a hundred plus person collaborative that meets on a, a biweekly basis and helps to better understand how uh, utility EWR programs can uh, best address the health, uh, safety, and comfort challenges that low-income customers and the associated housing that low-income customers live in um, currently face. One of the programs that has come out of that collaborative and is, is being piloted by DTE Energy at the moment is the energy health and safety pilot. It's really looking at uh, why um, many customers are deferred out of energy waste reduction programs and then potentially being able to fund or help them pay for uh, some of those uh, structural or repair challenges that they're facing uh, at those um, uh, or, or within those homes in order to put them on a pathway in order to be able to apply towards the uh, traditional energy waste reduction program. So uh, what we've seen here, at least in our initial pilot, is an identification of what uh, are some of the issues that low-income customers are facing when they are deferred out of that program and are beginning to get an idea on what are the per house or, or uh, per project costs for being able to pay down some of those uh, associated measures. And again, put those customers on a path to being able to participate in our uh, utility EWR program. So we're just beginning to see some of the initial results of this pilot, uh, but they've been uh, a very, uh, uh, positive thus far, and it's really been the effort of our staff working with utilities and with those stakeholder groups um, over the last several months uh, in order to um, have a, a program pilot option for low-income customers that really meets directly uh, their needs and, and the challenges that they face. The last thing I will say is that like many um, states that you work in, uh, Michigan is facing this uh, transition, rapid transition in our energy system and the, uh, you know, the reliability of our EWR programs will really 
uh, be indicative of how we are able to achieve some of the bold um, uh, carbon reduction goals that our utilities and our governor has set forth for the state over the next several decades. Just as an example, between 2018 and, and 2025, we'll see a reduction in terms of the percentage of coal generation in this uh, uh, in the state of Michigan go from 33% to 19%. Uh, we also will be taking offline a uh, nuclear power plant here in the state over the next uh, several years. So there are a, a number of uh, changes that are taking place in our, here in the state that require us to pay a lot more attention to uh, demand side uh, programs and services and how best uh, our customers um, can respond and, and be active participants in the reliability uh, and available capacity on our energy system. The last slide I'll present on is in response to this energy transition, the uh, governor's office and the Michigan Public Service Commission in 2019 launched an effort called My Power Grid. Uh, this is really looking at how can the commission best facilitate the transition to clean and distributed energy resources. Uh, so going out to the utilities and our broad stakeholder community in the state and nationally uh, to try and figure out how best we can outreach to customers, uh, engage them in education about this transition, and then partake in the needed regulatory reforms that maximize the benefit of this transition to all customer classes. And, and really it has a great connection to uh, EWR technologies and opportunities. Uh, one uh, initiative of the My Power Grid effort uh, that we are undertaking currently is the creation of an energy pilots directory through the commission. So beginning to better understand um, what uh, is the scope of ongoing utility pilots being presented before the commission and having a docket, one centralized location for the utilities to be able to uh, put forth those energy pilots, make them available to different stakeholders, uh, to um, uh, researchers, to academics, as well as commission staff, and then uh, set forth criteria so that utilities have a better understanding of what the commission expects and will approve as we see utility pilots, including uh, energy efficiency and energy waste reduction pilots uh, going forward. So again, I, I thank you for the time to present this. I, I look forward to the, the questions and I will go ahead and pass things off to Mark at Excel Energy. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Commissioner Phillips. So I'm going to, um, you know, I think we've heard already from Pat kind of on a, a, a workforce and a regional workforce perspective. And then Commissioner Phillips did a uh, a, a great job bringing in kind of the state and, and government perspective. Um, I'm going to shift the the perspective a little bit and talk about our uh, the impact to our customers as well as to our energy efficiency, our, our SIP DSM programs, um, kind of from the lens of a, a, an investor-owned utility. So if we jump into the slides, uh, for those of you that don't know, Xcel Energy is a fully vertically integrated utility. Um, we have uh, customers in eight states. Um, we are broken up into sort of four operating companies. And the first slide that we'll look at gives a little bit of detail around what's happened from the customer's perspectives uh, as far as our, our energy consumption trends. Let me back up. There we go. Customer usage trends. So what you can see is our residential customer usage over the first three quarters of 2020 has increased um, anywhere from about one and a half to a little over 3%. And our, you know, CNI customers across the board have been down anywhere from, from four to almost 8%. Um, these trends were much more uh, exaggerated, for lack of a better term, in kind of April, March, April, May timeframe. And they're starting to rebound. And again, what you see here includes everything year to date. So kind of normal operations, January, February. Um, the numbers aren't as large as Commissioner Phillips was talking about, partially because these are weather normalized um, data. And so, you know, 
short answer is a lot more residential usage, a lot less uh, commercial usage. We did, um, Excel did choose to suspend all disconnects um, as the pandemic, uh, the effects were starting to be seen, um, you know, which we think was the, uh, you know, it was a, a company decision. We think it was the right decision. Um, and that has sort of played out across all of our service territories. Um, I'm going to move next into a little bit about some of the uh, changes that we have made, um, focusing mostly on our, our DSM and our SIP programs. Um, and I'm going to kind of walk through this high level list fairly quickly and then go into a little more detail on two, uh, two things that, that have come out of uh, COVID, which I think have been very helpful to some of our customers. So um, this list of changes, you'll see some of these, you know, help customers, some of them help businesses. Um, as Pat talked about, you know, we, we understand that in order to continue serving customers with our energy efficiency programs, we need a healthy and vibrant network of, you know, vendors and contractors and suppliers to us. And so, you know, adjusting some of our programs to be remote, whether it's audits or, um, you know, contactless appliance pickup or some of our direct install programs, you know, shifting those over to be uh, where we'll do a remote audit and then we'll have the, the bulbs or shower heads or other water fixtures show up on the door uh, for a customer to install. And, you know, they can even be coached through, uh, you know, through a, a, a remote app. So it's kind of like a, a FaceTime call, if you will, with assistance for them to install some of those measures. Um, we also had to adjust uh, all of our, our school education kits. Um, you know, and I, I think from a, an in-person learning experience, not only to distribute the, the contents to, to kids, to um, students' homes, but also to adapt delivery of that content. And I think in, in some of those early days, um, we got quite a bit of feedback from educators that it was, it was a blessing that, you know, they had, they were kind of scrambling to figure out how to deliver some of this content remotely. And this was a, uh, an example they could use. And they had some kind of prepackaged out of the box, which gave them a little bit of breathing room. Um, we also uh, revised a bunch of our measurement and verification protocols, um, both on the individual project level um, as well as, as at the program evaluation level to allow those critical functions to continue to happen, um, you know, and to, to maintain and in some cases even increase the, the validity and the accuracy of those. And what's interesting is a lot of those techniques um, are, are things that we thought might work beforehand, but we never really had a, a need um, or enough motivation to, to try them. And having tried them, uh, there, there are things that we're going to continue to use and, you know, can ultimately over the long run allow us to do uh, more thorough uh, M&V and, and program evaluations at a reduced cost. So there's, there are some silver linings uh, coming out of this. Um, we also built and uh, a program for kind of work at home and, or, or, you know, energy savings kits for, for customers and, and families that were spending a lot more time at home. Um, and we were able to target, uh, you know, the, the types of measures that were in there and give customers kind of choices in what, uh, what they needed. So we, we very quickly uh, stood that up. It was about six weeks from initial idea to having kits shipped to customers uh, with a, a pretty nice interactive uh, tool for them to, to pick kind of the right kit that's right for them. So, um, a little further down the list, you'll see prescriptive and custom rebate bonuses. Um, we'll talk later about what we learned, but there were some, some areas of our programs and some customer segments that were um, very hard hit from a participation standpoint. And, uh, you know, bonuses and additional promotions are, are one method to try to help some of those customers. Although um, what we learned is it, you know, in some cases it, it wasn't enough and we saw some pretty steep decline in some of our, our programs and some of our offerings. Um, the second from the bottom there, uh, an interesting sort of ripple effect. I think you guys have, have probably all seen some supply chain hiccups. 
um, both on kind of the, the bulk, you know, residential appliance, whether it's refrigerators or whatnot, um, you know, there, there's hiccups in the supply chain that just make those less available. But even on a more nuanced, if you think about um, like split system air conditioners, you may not be able to get uh, exactly the right matching coil, interior coil with the right compressor. And so we worked to uh, work with our regulators and other stakeholders to kind of come to a balance of, you know, we may not be able to get the exact documentation for an HRI certification, but how can we continue to encourage customers to to move forward with efficient equipment and still be able to, to rebate and, and motivate them to do that um, without exactly all the documentation we're used to. So that was a pretty, uh, pretty creative solution there. Um, and then the last, uh, the last bullet is I'm using evaporative cooling as an example, but um, effectively our, our outreach tactics, you know, our, our business, there are a lot of programs that we rely on very close customer contact, whether it's, uh, marketing and promotion events in, you know, local Lowe's or Home Depot's um, or community outreach at, you know, the, the state fairs and those sorts. And uh, a lot of that was just taken off the table. And so we had to adapt those outreach tactics to, to reach customers. And, you know, it, it, again, pushed us to do some things we had thought about. Um, and, you know, we came up with some very creative uh, solutions. Our our evaporative cooling product manager, I think, had a great one where, you know, we hadn't done a ton of in-app advertising in the past, but uh, we worked with uh, the, you know, the Weather Channel app. And when, you know, people would pull up the forecast, it was going to be 95 degrees up pops uh, an insert um, around some of our cooling technologies with uh, with links to, to take action, which, you know, we're, it, it's that same one-on-one -on -one customer engagement, but instead of doing it, in a, a retail location, we're able to shift that over to, um, you know, to a, a different media. So um, I'm going to go into depth a little bit on two programs that that started up and were hugely successful and really targeted at the, the customers that were hardest hit. Um, one is we, we've been supporting, you know, food banks and food shelves. Um, you know, from sort of a charitable perspective within Excel Energy uh, for many, many years. And we, we got a little more directly involved and started to offer um, various energy saving measures um, directly at those, those food shelves and food banks. So as customers would come in to, um, you know, for, for food or other supplies, they could also pick up uh, whether it was light bulbs or water saving measures um, you know, aerators, as well as some educational information and kind of targeted links to what other steps they could take for, for low cost or no cost opportunities. Um, you know, we, through this program in 2020, through our, on our, our territories, we were able to distribute about two and a half million bulbs and that provided almost 25 million in lifetime net benefits to those customers. So a hugely um, effective way to very quickly get, you know, get um, equipment into customers' hands that they could install themselves and could have a very direct impact on their bills and, and help with that energy burden. Um, it was really refreshing for me that second bullet there is we had such strong support from stakeholders, um, you know, and there were real, there was nobody that was throwing up their hands saying, no, everybody was, this sounds like a great idea. How can we help and let's get it done. Um, and so that's been a hugely successful program for us. Um, and it's something that we are uh, going to continue in, in our jurisdictions as we move forward. Um, the next one is it, it's a, you know, we heard commissioner Phillips talk about customers in arrears. Um, we saw a, a large increase and, we started to take a proactive approach for customers in arrears to um, reach out to them, uh, primarily through, uh, you know, through mail and not just say, hey, you know, we know things are tough. We know you're struggling, but here's, here's some options. And here are, you know, we, we sent bulbs um, and we've started to include some, some water savings measures to, to really proactively give these customers things they could do. Uh, to help them reduce their energy burden. And this is true on 
you know, in multiple customer classes. So not just residential, but even, even some businesses as we, uh, we looked at and the, you know, we have targeted, um, targeted or, or tailored, uh, shipments to each of those customer classes. So, you know, what, what a, a small business a retail, small retail shop would need is a little different than what a residential customer would need. And so, um, in addition to those energy saving measures, um, we've also have, you know, the, the links to a bunch of our low cost and no cost opportunities. So we can not only give them something they can actually physically install, but give them information on uh, some lower no capital opportunities. Um, and, you know, we, we don't have an exact number for uh, how many have come out in the first wave, but it's about 100,000, which is, you know, we're in the ballpark of, of four to 5 million total customers. And so um, we are targeting the majority of customers that were current, but fell into arrears um, on or, or after March. And this is something that as we get the results, um, we're kind of studying to see just how much of an impact it has. And if those come out favorably, it's something that we want to continue uh, to move forward with. This was another one where um, as we have been working with stakeholders, there's been a ton of interest and a ton of great ideas to help flush it out and really evaluate kind of how impactful it can be. So um, I'm going to jump and get a little more specific on Minnesota, um, but also get a little broader on not just EE. So, you know, as a utility, we understand that we have a great connection with our customers through our, our energy efficiency programs. Um, but, but there's honestly more we can do. And we've worked with the, uh, a bunch of stakeholders in Minnesota to, to be part of and, and really a, a champion of this, of a $3 billion relief and recovery package that we announced in June. Um, and I've listed some of the details, um, you know, but effectively it's a, a mechanism to help put people back to work in Minnesota um, doing things that, that make a ton of sense for the future, right? And so whether it's repowering existing wind farms, uh, whether it's new solar uh, installations or, you know, expanding our, our energy efficiency programs. And, you know, for example, in both Minnesota and Colorado, we have uh, significant increases to the income qualified segment um, that are, are proposed and, you know, very nearly approved in, uh, in Colorado. And, and we're going to propose a whole bunch more shortly here in Minnesota. So this is a, a work in progress and it's kind of that multifaceted approach where there are a lot of different ways that we can, um, we can move forward and, and, and really, you know, help more than just, um, our direct customers. Um, my, my last slide is we're going to talk a little bit about what we've learned and these are kind of the high levels. There's a ton of detail behind these and I'd be happy to, you know, to chat, uh, you know, either through questions or, or following up later on more detail, but the, what's been interesting is it's been a very wide range of economic and behavioral impacts, right? There's no one size fits all answer. Um, you know, we had, uh, we have certain customer segments where in, in program segments, some of our, our longer lead time programs, such as our new construction programs, both on the, the residential and the business side that really showed very little to no impact. Um, you know, and I think some of that is that those, those projects on the business side are, are, you know, two to three year from project inception to, to final project delivery. And so those kept right on trucking. Um, the, the flip side to that is some of our short lead time business programs, um, whether it's some of our lighting programs or more of the uh, more uh, commodity sort of HVAC and cooling programs, they got hit pretty hard. Um, a lot of small businesses, you know, are, are not sure if they're going to be there and they are not investing. And these are some of the areas where we targeted bonuses um, both on the prescriptive and custom and outreach and, you know, even with very substantial bonuses, uh, performance and, and participation has been, has been very low um, in those areas. Um, jumping down to the fourth bullet, another interesting topic is we've actually seen very strong participation in some of our residential heating, residential cooling programs. And, you know, the best we can, and when I say strong, I mean, 
almost record setting, right? 20, 30% higher than, than our, our forecasts and our previous expectations. Um, and I think the, a lot of the, or what we kind of think is going on is there are customers that are still gainfully employed, are working remotely, um, are in a pretty good financial position. And frankly, they're spending more time at home and they are willing um, to invest in their home and invest in their comfort. Um, and so this, you know, is a little bit of a bright spot because for all those customers that are, are spending on new air, air conditioners, new heating systems, um, there are contractors that, that are, are installing those, right? And um, we've seen, you know, high penetration rates of putting in efficient equipment. So this is, this is kind of a bright spot. Um, the other bright spot, the next one down is overall residential um, EE awareness has, has increased. Customers are we, we do quite a bit of, of surveying and, and um, you know, market research while we operate our programs and customers are more aware of their energy bill and they're more aware of and asking about more energy efficient options. Um, a lot of those are what they're acting on. A lot of it is, is the, the low cost, no cost residential measures, right? So a lot of air sealing, a lot of uh, light bulbs, a lot of water saving measures, um, you know, and then, like I said, there's there's a lot of at the very kind of top end large capital for for HVAC systems, but we we have seen a little bit of a softening in the middle. So, with that, I think I am pretty close to time, and I will turn it back over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Mark. Um, it looks like we have about ten minutes before the uh, the panel allotted time is over. So I'd like to invite our other panelists to share their, their cameras because we had quite a few questions roll in um, and I hope we can get to as many of them as possible before we have to wrap up and, uh, and adjourn to the lounge. So um, the first question, this is something I was uh, curious about myself when I looked at your presentation, Pat. Um, do you have any thoughts as to why the job losses in Michigan are so much higher than in the other states highlighted in that slide? Well, I think the, the, the it's, there's probably part of it is um, intensity or, or size of the population. I mean, you'd have to look at it as a relative amount. And I, I don't have those numbers on the top top of my head, but I suspect that's uh, probably the driving uh, force there. Okay, fair enough. Uh, the second question is also for you, Pat, um, and it is, how do current stimulus drafts compare to what you have proposed? And how can we ensure that future stimulus benefiting the EE industry is directed first to the states and communities that have been hit the hardest? Well, um, really great question. Uh, Certainly the proposals that are, have been put together are quite similar. I want you to know that the energy efficiency industry that is uh, working on this type of legislation in DC is very cognizant of a couple of things. One is we should put money through existing programs because if it's going to be a brand new program that requires new regulations and it, it just isn't um, going to get to people uh, in a timely way. Um, so we've been really focused on that and certainly focused on utilizing uh, the vehicle of the energy offices to uh, you have money go to the states. Uh, the current uh, legislation that I'm familiar with are looking at 30 to 40% uh, spend on um, uh, vulnerable communities uh, and there are a gazillion different definitions of vulnerable community, and I couldn't uh, tell you which one it is, but uh, the, the uh, passion is there, and I'm sure that will get worked out if we are lucky enough to actually get a stimulus uh, conversation seriously going uh, in Congress. Thanks so much. Um, so many questions. I'm, I'm going to have to kind of curate them a little bit to make sure everybody gets a chance to answer a few. I'm going to skip over to um, a question or two for Commissioner Phillips. Um, this first one asks, can you describe the importance of the MPSC stakeholder collaboratives in assessing impacts 
and addressing affordability concerns through U2757? Yeah, that, that is our, our COVID-19 response docket. One thing I will say just to one of the questions that, that Pat, Pat answered or, or responses is just uh, the, the need for congressional action in terms of providing additional assistance to customers. Um, you know, what I mentioned in terms of not uh, us not issuing a, a moratorium on shutoffs for utilities, uh, all of our utilities did voluntarily uh, move forward with shutoff protections uh, throughout the summer months and into the fall. So similar to Excel there, uh, Mark. Uh, but really what we were able to do in terms of kind of limiting those arrearages and, and, and arrears uh, and, and stabilizing the situation for customers was the result of the CARES Act funding that was available and pushing that out and having it applied directly to uh, customer unpaid balances. And so, you know, we are in a bit of a different situation going forward without that, without that safety net. And so, uh, you know, I'll put that out into the ether. <laughs> I think we all have similar thoughts there, but uh, there needs to be some uh, congressional action. And then just uh, the, the need for collaboratives is um, incredibly important because a lot of these innovation often does not happen within our commission dockets. <laughs> it's, it's very difficult within the strict proceedings of uh, a rate case or integrated uh, resource planning uh, to be able to have some more of these innovative outcomes emerge. The other thing is it's a very high bar in terms of the, um, the know-how that you need to have and, and the money you need to have in order to participate in one of the proceedings at the commission. And we're certainly taking part in ways to address that. But having collaboratives that have a, a bit lower bar for a broader set of communities and stakeholders to participate and then to directly sit across the table with representatives from utilities, we've just been able to see a lot better outcomes come out of those proceedings, and then the staff can learn from that and integrate what they learn as they file and respond and intervene uh, in utility cases. Another question for you, Commissioner Phillips, perhaps related to the last one, um, specifically about the DTE health and safety pilot. Um, I know that there are, there are advocates working in stakeholders and um, LMI and EJ advocates who are really interested in getting something like that started in other states. Um, can, I don't know if you're familiar enough with kind of the inner workings of the program to share any learnings um, from that pilot, either how it was implemented or maybe even in the process of getting it approved to help some of those advocates pursuing similar programs in other states. Yeah, I think we're still trying to dissect uh, some of the outcomes of the pilot. What I will say is there's just increased uh, interest at kind of all levels of, of govern, uh, government here about how we can address indoor as well as outdoor air quality issues. And so programs like this where we can uh, potentially expend dollars not only to improve the indoor air quality of uh, these housing structures, but then also follow up with energy waste reduction improvements is just uh, incredibly important, particularly in, in uh, low income and in black and brown communities where uh, we know that the impacts of air quality and the associated uh, health implications of um, negative uh, air quality has a direct correlation to uh, some of the worst outcomes of the coronavirus. Thanks for that. Um, Getting down to the wire time-wise, but I have a good question here for uh, Mark that came in towards the end of your presentation. Um, the, the attendee asks, have the issues regarding utility bill affordability and shutoff concerns caused Excel to identify any ways to coordinate bill payment assistance, bill arrearage infer information and energy efficiency efforts, um, possibly a way to spread assistance further while reducing energy burden? Uh, yeah. EE. yeah, you know that it's it the situation has raised our our kind of concern around it and and I won't say that we have solutions yet. Um, the the pilot I talked about where we are, you know, sort of working together to find the customers in arrears and 
address them, you know, and, and proactively send them information as well as, as kits, um, that's a step in the right direction. And we are, you know, we're executing on it, but we're also kind of evaluating and, you know, looking to see, does it actually move the needle, right? Not only do the, the measures get installed and do customer, what's their uptake on other opportunities, but what's going to happen to their actual bill, you know, and, and frankly, we don't have the answers to that yet. That's going to have to kind of play out and some of that study will, will go, but it's been a, a great, um, again, motivation for us to start kind of talking within the company, within the different parts of the company. Um, just like, you know, I mentioned some of the M&B stuff that we're doing was we never had a, uh, we didn't have to do it in the past and this, the, the, the pandemic made us do it. Um, and it, there's been some upside to it. So we're, we're hopeful and we're excited that we will kind of be able to give a little more holistic and, and really proactive solution there. And, and ideally even, you know, keep customers out of this situation in the future. Great. Thank you. Um, I'm afraid we're not going to get time to ask all of these great questions. So folks who had unanswered questions, you're going to have to just come to the, to the full conference in February and delve in or reach out independently to our panelists. I do want to ask one more question selfishly as a ratepayer advocate. This is an issue that troubles me. Um, early on in the pandemic, of course, um, probably a lot of you are aware of um, attempts that were made in Missouri and Ohio to basically use this, um, this crisis as a way to attack energy efficiency programs. Um, and the question I'm gonna ask, I think it has a really obvious answer um, and probably all of you do too, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Has COVID-19 helped or hurt the case for energy efficiency? Um, I obviously think it has helped, but I want to get you guys' opinion. Um, you know, the, the efforts in Missouri and Ohio were quelled pretty quickly, but do we expect a resurgence of that um, going forward? I can take a shot from a utility perspective. Um, I honestly, you know, I think that in some ways the pandemic not necessarily has helped the case, but has helped um, us get comfortable with trying new things and trying more new things. And, you know, we've had to respond and there's been a lot of, of great um, ideas that have come to fruition and, and evolution of our programs that have ultimately made them more impactful, more cost effective. And so from that perspective, it, it absolutely helps the case, right? That we as an industry, we have to adapt we have to continue. And, you know, we, we just took kind of a, a step change. We took a big step forward on a lot of that. And, you know, we have the opportunity to learn and apply that moving forward. And so from that perspective, it's absolutely helped us to, to kind of get off center on a bunch of things. So go okay. ahead, Pat. Well, I was just going to say that um, we chair a, uh, uh, a group that focuses on state policy nationally. And, well, the initial um, attacks were very opportunistic and nobody had actually felt any pain yet. It was just, ooh, here's a good chance to go attack that energy efficiency funding that we don't like. Um, uh, I will say that we are very concerned that as the budgets in states uh, crater, um, that the attacks are going to be uh, uh, relentless and that uh, we will need all of the ammunition uh, we can bring to bear on um, energy burden and um, environment and health and uh, you know every argument we can muster. And Commissioner, thank you. Yeah, we have not seen uh, those arguments within the legislature or, or within the uh, arguments of interveners before the commission. I think that's that's primarily because one. Um, the goals that uh, and the targets set forth by um, utilities here in the state uh, have not been impacted uh, by the COVID-19 pandemic, even though it has uh, impacted how they've outreached or been able to go in the homes of customers, uh, that has not impacted their ability uh, to meet those goals and objectives. 
Also, we have uh, a performance-based structure around the energy efficiency targets here in the state. So uh, utilities are actually incentivized uh, to go beyond the state 1% uh, energy efficiency uh, targets set forth in statute. And so uh, to that extent, you know, we've seen in terms of the utilities meeting their uh, electricity energy efficiency goals of the last couple of years, uh, they've met those goals by 153% and then for natural gas by 144%. Uh, and that means that they're actually continuing to move forward and exceeding what the statute mandates for them in, in terms of those requirements. So I, I think one way that you can get around this is by getting the utilities on board with supporting these programs and, and having those objectives be uh, and then incentives related to uh, that be performance-based. Great, thank you so much you all for answering that. Um, and thank you for your time today. Thanks to everybody for tuning in. Um, we're going to have to wrap up, but I'd like to invite everyone to join small group discussions to network and catch up with each other. All you have to do is click on the lounge tab in the platform to see the topic options and jump on in. And don't forget to check out our sponsor profiles under the sponsor tab. And um, thank you again, you all.